Good morning. We're so happy to have you here with us this morning. I'm Hannah Belsito, Chief Experience Officer at Destination Cleveland, Cleveland's destination marketing and management nonprofit organization. We're excited to partner with Association Forum for another healthcare collaborative session. The travel, tourism, and hospitality industries have been significantly impacted by the pandemic across the globe. We're standing together with our industry near and far to support its recovery and regrowth, both in the short and long term. Consumers seek assurances that destinations and businesses within them are committed to help ensure their health and safety. In Cleveland, our word is our bond. Our Clean Committed program asks business owners for their word to help ensure a consistently safe and responsible reopening of Cleveland's hospitality, entertainment, and tourism industries. The program requests a voluntary commitment to a standard set of cleanliness practices to help minimize the spread of COVID-19. The practices were developed in partnership with our region's healthcare experts, who you're going to hear from today, at the Metro Health System, also Cleveland Clinic, University Hospitals, and both the City of Cleveland and Cuyahoga County Board of Health. In less than six months, more than 700 local businesses have made the commitment, giving their word to customers that they're standing together to help ensure customer safety. We're encouraging locals and visitors to keep an eye out for the clean committed seal when eating out, shopping, and visiting local attractions or ordering products or food online in Cleveland. All clean committed businesses are listed on our website at thisiscleveland.com being promoted through our owned, earned, and paid media campaigns. In addition, all clean committed businesses received complimentary consumer clean kits to distribute to their customers. We've distributed nearly 175,000 clean kits to businesses and directly to consumers. Each kit contains a three-ply paper mask, Purell singles, advanced hand sanitizer packs, and a safety information card for businesses to distribute to their customers. We are excited to be able to provide each of you with a clean kit to use when you're visiting your favorite travel, tourism, and hospitality businesses. More information will be coming on that soon. Now, I'd like to introduce you to today's speaker, who I know you're all here to see. Dr. Nabil Shahade is Executive Vice President, Chief Clinical Transformation Officer at the Metro Health System, one of the largest and most comprehensive health systems in Northeast Ohio. He's a practicing physician with more than 10 years of advanced management and executive leadership experience and a graduate of the Harvard Business School of Advanced Management program. He's held several executive leadership roles in healthcare operations, medical informatics, and physician leadership development. Dr. Shahade came to Metro Health in 2016 from HealthSpan Physicians and the Ohio Permanente Medical Group where he served as Chief Executive Officer and Market President since 2013. He also held positions including Executive Medical Director, Chief Medical Informatics Officer, and Chief of the Department of Urology. Most recently, Dr. Shahade oversaw all aspects of the Population Health Program at HealthSpan and Ohio Permanente Medical Group, Kaiser Permanente, Ohio helping the organization achieve a number one ranking in Ohio for health plans, private and Medicare by the National Committee for Quality Assurance for 2013 through 2015. His vision is to transform healthcare from a fee-for-service care model into total population health and wellness while leveraging innovation to make healthcare personal, easier and more affordable. Thank you again for joining us today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Shahade. So good morning, everyone. Um, it is again, my honor and privilege to present to you our Metro Health System journey towards addressing the social determinant of health. We are doing this so everyone can live their healthiest life. So who are we? Um, we are a public essential health system located in Northeast Ohio, and we've been around for 183 years uh, and truly serving the community since the beginning. Our patient mix and population is, is interesting and unique by itself and, and leads itself uh, to the discussion of social determinant of health. 38% of our patient population is Medicaid and another 7% are uninsured. So basically 45% of our patient are 
uh, Medicaid and uninsured and uh, affected significantly with the social determinant of health. Not to state that the other 55% uh, are not uh, affected and we will show some of those uh, uh, numbers and what we're talking about. Uh, what you see on the screen is um, our uh, new hospital uh, that we're very proud. The tower is, is almost up there and it's all uh, funded uh, uh, by, by our health system um, and should be in occupancy very early 2023. So what's our mission? Our mission is leading the way to a healthier you and a healthier community through service, teaching, discovery, and teamwork. Recently, in the last two years, uh, Metro Health went into, like most of your organization, into developing their uh, uh, strategy for the next uh, 10 years. And they have identified five pillars of that strategy. Remarkably, in one of those pillar is for Metro to be leading as a community convener and promoter of social determinant of health. So this is now part of our uh, strategy going forward and part of our DNA uh, moving forward. So why and why do we care? And what is this social determinant of health? So let's be very clear. These are the factors that influence a person's health status. The why do we care, and especially here in Northeast Ohio, but our city is not different uh, from probably the city that you come from. There is a 23 year life expectancy disparity between any two neighborhood two miles apart in Northeast Ohio. 20, again, I wanna say 23 years life expectancy. And why is that? That's because 80% of what affects health truly happens outside of clinical setting. So as you can see the color coordinated wheel on the screen, if you look at the yellow and the light blue, this is what traditional clinical care is. This is the gene and biology and the clinical care. And the other 80% is this other stuff. And this is what we call the social determinant of health or the factors that influence the health status of a person other than the genes and the clinical care. These are the socioeconomic environment like education, oppor uh, employment opportunities, living wages, etc. This is also, and this is the biggest bucket, that's about 40%. 30% are the health behavior, like healthy eating, exercising, et cetera. And last but not least is that other 10% is your physical environment and where you live. Now we can argue about those percentages going a few percentages up or down, but it does not change the big picture. And that is that no matter how much we do uh, within our clinical environment, traditional clinical environment, we are only about to influence 20% of somebody's health outcome. I want you to take uh, a, a little bit of time and uh, discuss this 2020 Ohio County Health Ranking. Uh, by the way, this is available to every county in the USA. It's the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation with the University of Wisconsin. They published this. You can Google it. You can find very quickly your own county. And on the left side, it just shows what I just uh, uh, discussed with you. What are the health factors and how they uh, uh, affect uh, the percentage uh, of the outcome um, of the uh, uh, health that we're talking about, that is the uh, life expectancy and the quality of life. When we looked at our specific uh, county ranking, and that's in uh, Cuyahoga County, uh, that houses some of the most world-renowned health system, um, 
uh, including Cleveland Clinic, University Hospital, and our South Metro Health that are the largest three health system. And if you look at the clinical care that's in light blue, we rank even in, in those uh, uh, metrics, we, we rank ninth within uh, the, uh, the rest of the counties in Ohio. But when it comes to health outcomes, uh, and that's where shame on us, we rank 75th out of 88 counties. So again, we are world renowned uh, for healthcare. We are the destination for healthcare. And that is in the traditional way of healthcare. What happens usually in a hospital system in the outpatient clinic. What we want to do and what we are embarked on is basically to really move that health outcomes to be the best, not only in Ohio, but actually in the country, in the country and be an example of how we can even move our health outcome to be one of the most renowned uh, uh, in the world. With that said, it's very clear that wellness goes way beyond medical care. Therefore, we must expand our reach because health happens in communities So we imagine a community where we see the full picture of our patient and their lives beyond the walls of Metro Health, or for that matter, any health system. We imagine a community without barriers between health and social services, where people can be e-connected to services they need with closed loop communication. Finally, we imagine a community where we can identify and eliminate potential barrier to health and well-being based on evidence to better allocate time and resources. This is what we believe uh, health uh, should become. This here is a short list and truly a short list. There are two similar slides. I did not bother to add them to illustrate how many programs Metro Health have in place to addressing the social determinant of health. This is, again, we've been in the community more than 183 years and the nature of our mission and the nature of our patient population really pushed us to address the social determinant of health for the last 183 years. However, when I was challenged to look at all those programs and on this page, there's about 50 of them. But if we really want to count, we had two years ago when I started counting, again, I said there are two more slides like this. We counted more than 140 programs. The problem with those 140 programs, they did good on an individual. Sometimes they did good on an individual level, but they were not comprehensive and not well organized to determine where is the best resources that can be deployed for a certain community to certain patient population or to a certain individual? And how can we prove that our intervention made a difference and a difference in what? So with that said, we decided we're gonna organize our work and came in the introduction and the birth of our Institute for Hope. So our Institute for Hope stands the H for health. Everything that we're gonna talk about is towards improving the health and the health outcome of the individual, the community. The way we're gonna do this by identifying opportunity, opportunities to make a difference, to make a change. Once we identify where the issue is and where the opportunity to make a difference in, in somebody's health outcome, we're gonna look for partners within the community to work together in order to make that difference. Finally, last but not, and not least, the E is as important as the H and the O and the P. Because what we want to do 
is truly to co-create a self-sustaining community where everyone is empowered to live their healthiest life. And of course, this is a mural that we designed to really represent what the H and the O and the P and the E are. So this is the framework that we put together that we are leading with and we are designing our institute and our work around and we're being organized around. We want to build healthy families and thriving communities. What does that mean? This is the blue part of the circle. This is where we actually screen for the social determinant of health. We try to identify where the issue is. This is where we actually, once we identify where the issue is, we make the connection to the community partner and we make the referral and we make sure that those gaps are closed and the solution is provided to the patient or the, to the community. So this is the actual programs, the actual 140 programs that I was talking before that they get organized and come together uh, around around uh, major themes like housing, like school health, uh, uh, like uh, uh, social isolation. And we'll talk a little bit more about this. But we don't stop in there. The yellow is about transforming knowledge and education. We really want to educate, train, and transform. We want to develop an organizational and a community culture that's truly equipped with knowledge, resources, and system, inspired and empowered to address the social determinant of health. So just fixing the problem now is not good enough. We want to create this culture of change and identifying those issues way before they become problems. Finally, is the orange. And the orange is advanced innovative practices. This is where we want to bring science to our interventions. We're gonna measure, we're gonna research, we're gonna advocate about the solution that we're putting in place and advocate on the national level to change policies so that we can expand the programs and, and, and make them more sustainable on the long run. So this is the framework that we are proposing and that we started our Institute uh, for Hope. So let's start with the screening. It's a data-driven action. And our goal at Metro Health, we, we have about 300 plus thousand unique uh, patients at Metro and we, want at least on the first pass to screen every single one of them. We started this journey uh, very in the middle of last year, 2019, and we were slow to start because it takes a lot of logistics to get to do those screening. And in the middle of all of our effort and starting the effort, COVID came by. And we'll talk a little bit more in details about that. But what does screening domains include? We're screening for food insecurity, social connection, intimate partner violence, financial resource strain, transportation, housing and utilities, physical activity, digital connectivity, employment, stress, et cetera. We are screening in person uh, when we can, but also electronically leveraging our, our electronic connection to our patient when it's available and more so often during the COVID crisis, like every, everything else, here we are today, we're not in person, we are virtual and we're doing the same. One of those things that we're screening for is intimate partner violence. I want to really emphasize this one. And this is a lesson learned. The pace that we are going with and screening is limited by the quick attention and the red flag that we get once one of those intimate partner violence is flagged through the screening, because those will uh, take a sense of urgency and needs to be acted on ASAP by a human being within a few hours of that screening. 
and, and we've implemented uh, those workflows. Where are we today? We already have screened 10% of all of our patient, or we would have completed by the end of this month, which is very uh, uh, close to, to, to the end. Uh, this is a big milestone for us. Uh, we have pivoted, as I said, a lot of our screening to electronic screen through my chart rather than the care coordinator. And this is important because one of the things that we're screening for is digital connectivity. So obviously there is a little bit of bias that we're seeing now uh, how people are answering their digital connectivity because simply said, we're using electronic methods to screen them and most likely they're not having those hardship into uh, digital connectivity if they're able to be screened that way. And that's something we recognize and we will adjust for it hopefully post COVID when we have more uh, in-person screening. Our first results that I would like to share with you is our own employee. We, I'm showing this just to bring attention to what we're able to do. This is not just talking about screening. This is actually getting the data out and understanding our own employees and what programs we need to provide to them to help them. And by the way, we allow our employees to be anonymous when they take those screening. And we've put special uh, workflow for this intimate partner violence because of the being anonymous when, when you're doing those screening. With that said, and no, I mean, no surprise whether we're a healthcare organization that the, the, the highest uh, uh, problem that we have or factor is daily stress. This is probably not true of our larger patient population, but this is why being able to segment the population that you are screening so you can direct intervention, uh, sometimes on, on pro, pro, uh, programmatic intervention on a larger community or in a larger with, a, with an employer that is specific to them. But you'll see a theme of the food insecurity and the social connection risk uh, being very high as we continue this presentation this morning. Again, another uh, uh, depiction of how detailed our analytics that we brought into our data, because data for the sake of data means nothing. Screening for the sake of screening means nothing. Do we understand our data? Can we get some patterns out of that data so we can really laser focus our intervention? This is showing how we can zoom into practice, our primary care practices, and look at different patterns of these factors within, uh, uh, within those practices. But we're, what we're not showing yet in here, because we don't have enough statistically enough uh, volume to show at the individual provider and the provider panel and their patient and how they are uh, uh, composed of those factors. Again, just a quick look at our patient. You see how the deep red, the social isolation is. Could this be also that we are now screening a lot of our volume during COVID? It remains to be seen, but that's a little bit more of the study that we'll do hopefully post COVID. But again, food insecurity it really, really uh, uh, comes in close second. Another way of looking at the data is by payer. And um, this is real data. Um, and why do we show this? It is very important and we realize the same way that 80% of those social determinant of health that affect the health outcomes, that should translate into affecting the total cost of care. And the payers are becoming more attuned to this notion and are more interested in, in getting a better understanding about what is their patient population look like. I don't think they know this stuff, but we are starting to provide this kind of data and working with them 
to show them how their patient population stacks up and where the issues and where they need to uh, uh, develop and, and provide solutions and resources. So now we screen, what do we do with, uh, with this information? Uh, we want to connect uh, uh, our, 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 our patients, depending on how they screen, to a community-based organization that actually can uh, act upon those requests and fulfill the need, the gap that we identified. And we have launched to uh, put an electronic referral system to the community, and it's a bi-directional uh, HIPAA secured communication that uh, between Metro Health and the community-based organization when we make those referrals. And um, it is very important uh, part of the work to be able to, to provide this. And we're the first one here in Ohio to implement this uh, bi-directional interface, but we are not the first by any stretch of the imagination in the nation. This is becoming the norm that we all need to evolve to. So we partner with Unite Us and we created this Unite Ohio network. We're starting with our county, uh, Cuyahoga County, where we actually build a network of uh, a community based organization uh, where we can have this uh, bi directional community. We build it from the bottom up by partnering with, with this uh, uh, Unite uh, Us and we create. Uh, this Ohio network specific called Unite Ohio. So how does it work? This is to give you an example for those who are not familiar. So Tom, this is a, 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 an a, a illustrative example. Tom shows up at Sue's organization for in, in our case is to Metro Health. We do the screening. I showed you what we screened for or it's an electronic virtual screening these days. And suddenly we identify needs. We put an electronic referral uh, for those needs through the platform and the request goes up to, out to the network. There might be multiple requests. There might be housing instability. There might be food insecurity. There might be digital connectivity issues. And those requests are out there for the community. There might be multiple organizations that's dealing with food insecurity, but the beauty about this, if one organization takes to fulfill this, it, the other organization will uh, see that somebody else took this request so they don't have to duplicate the effort. And again, we know when the uh, uh, community-based organization was able to fulfill uh, the need and it's a closed loop uh, uh, referral and uh, more to come. So we just launched this not too long ago, um, a, a basically a, a short four weeks ago and we already have results and, and uh, the most important again, a, a theme that I hope I'm stressing upon here is that we are collecting data and information to understand what the impact we're making and, and where we're going with this. So, so far we've made 292 uh, referral uh, and we have uh, 43 community-based organization that already have joined and signed up uh, uh, for, for the services. And by the way, when those uh, organization uh, join uh, uh, the service, they don't have to pay for the licenses. We Metro Health uh, are the sponsors and we provide those licenses uh, for them. We've made more than 320 electronic referrals since then uh, for 151 unique clients. Again, that means the average is about two needs per referrer, per client, per patient. We have closed the loop uh, on 31 cases, because as you see, this is very short period of time. And probably the majority that we close very quickly are the food insecurity, because that, those are the easier to start acting upon them. So 
what are we referring and how our referral uh, been looking like? Again, data is data is data. As you can see, no surprise, the highest one is uh, for food assistance. Um, and there's housing and shelter comes in in very close second. This is a graph that depicts how we can track our diversity by gender and age. Uh, and, and truly no surprise in here, women are a little bit uh, uh, of a majority of those that we're making the referral for. And age is, is, is equitable throughout, as you can see with very colorful uh, uh, chart. We also look at race and ethnicity. Um, and again, the results are not surprising, uh, but uh, uh, Black African American takes the majority of 61%. And when we look at ethnicity for us, um, a little bit more prominent is the Hispanic and Latino. And that is uh, because of where we are located uh, in Northeast Ohio. And that's the community that we are located in. This is a long list of the CBO partners that we have put on the network. Again, this is an individual effort with each one of those organization to consent, sign up, provide a license to them, putting them on the network. And we've been only one month live and more requests are coming. And what is next for us is continuously build on this network throughout the state. Uh, we cannot have this conversation without talking about our uh, uh, response to COVID. We started our, 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 our COVID journey by putting a 24-7 uh, nurse triage and a physician-led hotline available to all. And I mean available to all, regardless of whether they are Metro Health patient or they are able to afford a telehealth visit. Um, the remarkable things in here is that so far 36,000 calls uh, we've received. And, and as you can see from the uh, heat map, uh, there are a lot of them are outside of our uh, usually service area. And the program is growing. And I won't be sharing this kind of information if I was not going to stress that half of those that call end up by having a physician visit uh, by telehealth. But most important, and that's why I'm sharing this, that a quarter of all the calls that we got uh, uh, turned up to be either uh, uh, COVID positive or they were requested to self quarantine for a, a couple of weeks. And since the volume, and you can see about 8,000 plus of those that we've asked to self-quarantine, we follow up on them on a regular basis. And we have our care coordinator, the social workers, the community health workers, and our, uh, our patient navigator, all making calls and checking on those patients and the well-being on those patients. And we screen them for the social determinant of health and understanding now we're asking them to self-isolate. What's going to happen? How can we support them? Well, the first thing is obviously we, that this is a very stressed population to start with. And now we're asking them to self-quarantine. Food is a major issue. We got a GoFundMe campaign and we get additional funding that we put purely to go and buy grocery. Our entire executive team became a grocery logistic team. We transformed our school health bus that I'll show you a picture in a minute into a delivery bus. We will go and shop for those patients and deliver personally meals for them. We also proactively delivered meals for shelters uh, and care packages. I like I'm showing on this slide 
but also emotional support. We created a lot of programs and hotlines to connect those patients and keeping them engaged uh, and providing support to them. This is why I'm sharing this slide. Now talking in the last 10 minutes or so of this presentation about our digital inclusion and connectivity, uh, it is no doubt one of the major issues, although it's not reflective in our data. And I, again, I stated why it is not reflective on this data. But one of the things we've done is we studied our neighborhood where and, and where the MH is where our towers are. And we have all kinds of demographic and we looked at the chronic disease of the patient, et cetera. We put a tower on top of our hospital towers to uh, provide digital connectivity to the neighborhood. And with the support of multiple donors, we're able to provide that service and we subsidize uh, a, a, a internet to those patient population. And our target here is about a thousand uh, uh, family. One of the activities that we've done, we, we, we outreach to one of the Cleveland Metro, uh, Metro uh, Housing Authority and looked at one of their uh, largest congregation uh, where, as you can see, it's very uh, diverse uh, population of inhabitants, but they have significant chronic disease and they lack digital connectivity and, and they needed special attention. So what did we do? We parachuted to that uh, development. We screened everybody for social determinant of health. We provided, again, we partnered, I, I failed to say, we partnered with the Greater uh, Cleveland Food Bank, MedWorks Digital C, and we started working with this patient, uh, with this, uh, I won't say patient, with this population. Uh, and we provided them with the connectivity. We also uh, connected them to food program. Uh, we made transportation irrelevant by training them on doing telehealth visits, but also we looked at their financial security and offer training for online banking for that. We went beyond and connected people to how to use Facebook and brain games just to keep them engaged. Social connection, uh, again, as stated before, is one of the major factor uh, and people are uh, taking it a little bit lightly uh, of the impact of social isolation. It truly has an impact on risk of hospitalization, uh, risk of emergency visits and worse outcome uh, of uh, uh, health uh, uh, failure uh, events. So with that said, two programs I would like to highlight here. One is the Calls for Hope and the other one is the Open Table. Basically, those are both volunteer program designated to provide support to individual and their families to get them out of that isolation and bringing the, them back to the community. We've been very successful with both of those programs and we're hoping to publish some of that data very soon. It, it, we can't be fair without talking about food security um, and what we've done. We have partnered and provided many programs around food and food insecurity, food as medicine, uh, free summer lunch programs, et cetera. But more important, we are putting a program to study our uh, uh, pr uh, prescription uh, 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 food as a prescription, food as medicine, and study the outcome of those interventions. A little example of food as medicine clinic that we have, we have about 90 participants, and when we looked at them, only 50% uh, stay engaged after we provided them um, uh, food after three months. And we tried to figure out why. We thought maybe it is the distance and the geography for them to come and pick up we couldn't tell, but what we found that once we made a better referral and better connection, and instead of the individual coming to our facility to pick up uh, food, we actually can deliver to them. Actually, it was cheaper to do that. 
and the stickiness to the program uh, was significant. And this is where I said we're going to evaluate and, and publish some of that data hopefully soon as well. Can't be fair without talking about our, our kids and the school have programs. We were in nine schools uh, last year. This year we are in 12 schools. This is the, uh, the van that we employ and this is the van that while the school is closed, we've been using to deliver groceries. Very important in the school health program because not only on the health outcome, direct health outcome that we can measure and that's by decreasing the emergency room utilization. But more importantly, uh, uh, students perform better. There is uh, absenteeism is cut by 50% and a 0.5 improvement in the grade point average uh, of those patients. So in conclusion, I'm gonna take you back uh, through all those conversations. I could keep, uh, go, uh, keep on going and uh, discuss more programs that we have. But the point I'm making is that we are providing those services so we can make an impact on health. We are not replacing those community-based organizations. We're just connecting the dots. And we're doing all of this so we can make health better and available to all. It is very important for us to inform and engage policymaker. This is truly part of who we are and what we're, what we're intending to do. Not only we're providing those intervention, but also the framework that we're presenting and how we're approaching so we can study and understand the patient population and their need. So we can make closed loop referral. We can study those intervention and their outcome. We can look at not only the health outcome, but the total cost of care, which is very important for our country to understand for our legislature, to understand the importance of the social determinant of health. We want to be one of the national leader in uh, approaching the social determinant of health. With that said, our goal is to determine collectively which program and practice are most effective through rigorous evaluation and information. And finally, our promise is that the Institute for Hope will influence and advance practices and partnership through operational integration, research, publication, policy change, and financial support. One more time, so all of us can live our healthiest life. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Shahade. At this point in time, we're going to um, open it up for questions. If you could all use the chat functionality to send any questions you might have um, our way, we will make sure that we put them in front of Dr. Shahade. So Dr. Shahade, one to, to start with is um, what you view the role of collaboration amongst healthcare organizations that might typically compete with each other um, in, in working together to, to address these, these kind of issues and to ensure um, total health of the population and, and to address um, broader healthcare accessibility. Yes, um, so again, part of the Hope uh, Institute for Hope is the P and that's the partnership. And the partnership does not stop with partnering with a community-based organization, but that is truly partnering with all. And we cannot take the mantle and do all of this on our own. Other health system have equal and should have equal commitment to this journey. When, for instance, when we selected uh, uh, Unite Us to work and build that uh, a network, we didn't do it on our own. We convened uh, a lot of our partners uh, and community organization to come at the table with us and evaluate with us the best solution that we should use. Now we are a complex city and uh, we had a sense of urgency but why we had a sense of urgency to go it alone initially with the network, uh, because that's part of our mission and what we want to lead with, 
we have worked with the other uh, organization uh, in town to make sure that they understand how we selected, why we selected, and encourage them to make the same decisions. Uh, but even if they don't, the processes are very similar. We are on a journey to share our findings and our best practices. Again, what I said, if we are just doing this for our own patient, we will only succeed as such. Our intention is to fully succeed in Northeast Ohio, because if we just rely on ourselves, we're not gonna improve our rankings, uh, no matter what we do, but also our intention, not just in Northeast Ohio, but in Ohio, our intention is not just in Ohio, our intention is in the entire country. Great, thank you. Um, another question is relative to, you mentioned some, some great ways in which you were getting out into the community um, with programs and connectivity, but any tactics as to how you're reaching um, certain populations that may have a level of distrust um, with healthcare providers um, and what support um, you're being offered from the broader community to reach those folks, whether at the you know, the city level, the, low, uh, the, the county level, um, or even broader than that? Yeah, so, I'll, so I, I let me start from the beginning. Uh, this is a little bit what differentiate us from the other health system is that we've been in the community for 180 plus years and knowing that we service a majority of patients that are underprivileged. So we might not have that trust barrier as prominent as others might have it. And that's by the definition of who we are, okay? Having said that, again, we don't do the work by ourselves. We work within the community, we engage uh, leadership within the community to allow us to be with them. I'm gonna give you an example. Vida is one of those that I went through two seconds and showed you the, the slide about our food insecurity intervention. Vida is one of those programs. What is Vida? Vida is when we brought a chef. Again, I, we have a, a, a Latino community uh, around us. And one of the things that we have realized potentially is not uh, the inability and access to food, but not knowing how to cook healthy within their culture, okay? So we brought in chefs that are Latino uh, uh, chefs that can work with the churches within our community and bring in moms mostly and teach them how to cook healthy within their culture. Then, then, once that trust has happened and, and they are able to do so, we send them out into the community and recruit more mom and teach them how to cook healthy. But again, talking about trust, once they allow those chefs and moms to go into their uh, houses and homes to really help them, I said, well, we're, they already opened their doors why don't we go in, assess them, assess them clinically, screen them for diabetes, screen them for chronic disease, screen them for SDOH, and bring in a doctor to their own dwelling. And actually we did that and, and with a lot of success. So it's a stepwise approach. You build a trust and then you take advantage of that trust in a positive way and build on it. Great, thank you so much. I don't see any other questions at this point in time. So once again, thank you so much, Dr. Shahade. We are, have already had requests um, for some access to the information that you shared. Um, I am going to turn it over to Gordon Taylor, who is Destination Cleveland Senior Vice President of Meetings and Convention um, to close us out. But we are so grateful for your time um, and for your leadership and expertise and for sharing that with our attendees. 
It's, it's my pleasure. And again, we'll be more than happy to share the information, not just the slide. We're more than happy to, to work with others uh, and explain what we're doing in a little bit more details. Wonderful. So with that, I'll turn it over to Gordon. Thanks, Anne-Marie, and thank you, Dr. Uh, Shahade. I thought that was a, a really fascinating and engaging presentation. I thought everything you covered was incredibly uh, timely today, especially with the correlation that um, social isolation, that keeps sticking out of my mind watching your presentation, which is what so many people are dealing with in one form or another is just not good for your health. And I thought the uh, the other thing I thought of was the Scranton Castle example you gave regarding the to improve the quality of life for the population there. It was really uh, just amazing with all the work you're doing. So thanks again for being here. I wanna thank everybody else that was able to join our call today. Uh, thank the Association Forum uh, for the opportunity. And then just in closing to let everybody know, we do have uh, one more webinar coming up. It's a week from this Friday. So it's on Friday, November 6th. It's at 10 a.m. Central, 11 a.m. Eastern. Uh, the topic's going to be future of medical tourism as an export industry in the post-COVID area. And we will have Nazar Zane uh, from the Cleveland Clinic uh, joining us. So we hope to see you on that call. And thanks again, everybody, for, uh, for your time and a great day. Thank you.